to destroy the image of God of your neighbor. You know, Joseph Stalin was a young seminary student preparing to go into ministry. It's an incredible twist and irony in history. He was a seminarian studying theology, going to go into ministry, and he came to the conclusion that he didn't need God. When he became the head man of that Soviet empire, even Lenin said he was fearful of what this man would ultimately do. Do you know what he did? He killed 15 million of his own people. Think about that. He was torturing them. He was dehumanizing them. And as I've often told the story of a Western diplomat who'd gone to see him and said, Mr. Stalin, how much longer are you going to keep torturing your own people and expecting them to follow you? And he sat at the table and asked for a live chicken to be brought to him. The chicken was brought and he clutched the chicken and defeathered that bird systematically till the whole body was denuded. And he put that live chicken down on the floor, picked up a piece of bread, walked away for a few paces, and the chicken hobbled over towards him, nestled between his trouser legs for warmth. And Stalin bent down with a piece of bread in his hand, and the chicken started pecking away at it. He said, Madam, did you get your answer? I tortured that chicken. It'll follow me for food the rest of its life. People are like that chicken. You torture them, and they will follow you for food the rest of their lives. You know, my wife is here tonight, and I'd been invited to lecture some years ago at the Lenin Military Academy in Moscow and to engage the faculty in a discussion at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow as well, where all of their heads of state have graduated in the last two or three generations and more. And I remember at the end of that, one of my discussions there, which lasted three hours with the faculty, all of whom were atheists, and the head of the department, the head of the institution was shaking hands with us and they were lined up to bid us goodbye. And he shook my hands and he says, Mr. Zacharias, I want to thank you for coming here. I believe the answers you've given to us today are true, but it's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. My wife and I were taken out for lunch by the general and I told him the story about Stalin. He was sitting across the table as we were eating this very modest lunch and his lips started to quiver and his eyes became moist. He didn't know how to even respond to it. God gave me the great privilege of seeing General Kirshen come to Christ and give his life over to Christ because the man who had made himself God over his own people. <laughs> found out there's no way when man becomes God that you don't end up actually dehumanizing the rest of us in the process for humanity. All of us have that corruption of heart where it is not just power that corrupts, it's an intoxication with our egos and ourselves that ultimately breaks us up from the inside. Morality, who needs it? God, who needs it? Do you know, we are struggling to answer these questions now and listen to the poet and listen to the philosopher who deals with this issue of moral absolutes. Both are very sarcastic, both of them Englishmen. Steve Turner who says this, we believe today in Marx, Freud and Darwin. We believe everything is okay. As long as you don't hurt anyone to the best of your definition of hurt and to the best of your definition of knowledge. We believe in sex before, during, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is fun. We believe that taboos are taboo. We believe that everything's getting better despite evidence to the contrary. The evidence must be investigated and you can prove anything with evidence. We believe there's something in horoscopes, UFOs, and bent spoons. Jesus was a good man just like Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, although we think some of his good morals were really bad. We believe that all religions are basically the same. At least the ones that we read were, they all believe in love and goodness. They only differ on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. <laughs> we believe that after death comes the nothing, because when you ask the dead what happens, they say nothing. <laughs> if death is not the end and if the dead have lied, then it's compulsory heaven for all, excepting perhaps Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan. We believe in Masters and Johnson, what's selected is average, what's average is normal, and what's normal is good. 
We believe in total disarmament. We believe there are direct links between warfare and bloodshed. <laughs> Americans should beat their guns into tractors and the Russians would be sure to follow. We believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that lets him down. <laughs> this is the fault of society. Society is the fault of conditions and conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him and reality will adapt accordingly. The universe will readjust, history will alter. We believe that there is no absolute truth except for the truth that there is no absolute truth. <laughs> we believe in the rejection of creeds and the flowering of individual thought. And then he puts this postscript. If chance be the father of all flesh, disaster is his rainbow in the sky. And when you hear state of emergency, sniper kills 10, youths go looting, bomb blast school, it's but the sound of man worshiping his maker. If chance is the father of all flesh, Disaster is his rainbow in the sky. And when you hear state of emergency, sniper kills 10, troops on rampage, youths go looting and bomb blast school, it is but the sound of man worshiping his maker. Listen to the words of G.K. Chesterton. The new rebel who's rebelling against all authority is a skeptic and will not entirely trust anything. He has no loyalty, therefore he can never be a true revolutionist. And the fact that he doubts, doubts everything gets in his way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciation implies a moral doctrine of some kind. And the modern revolutionist doubts not only the institution he denounces, but the doctrine by which he denounces it. So he writes one book complaining that imperial oppression insults the purity of women, and then writes another book, a novel, in which he insults it himself. He curses the Sultan because Christian girls lose their virginity, then curses Mrs. Grundy because they keep it. As a politician, he cries out that war is a waste of life. Then as a philosopher, that life itself is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant, then prove by the highest philosophical principles that the peasant ought to have killed himself. A man denounces marriage as a lie, then denounces aristocratic profligates for treating it as a lie. He calls the flag a bubble, then blames the oppressors of Poland or Ireland because they take away that bubble. The man of this school goes first to a political meeting where he complains that savages are treated as if they were beasts. Then he takes his hat and umbrella and goes on to a scientific meeting where he proves that they practically are beasts. In short, the modern revolutionist, being an infinite skeptic, is always engaged in undermining his own minds. In his book on politics, he attacks men for trampling on morality. In his book on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling on men. Therefore, the modern man in revolt has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he has lost his right to rebel against anything. A New York Times journalist phoned about four weeks ago and he asked me what I thought of this economic crisis. I said, I'd like it if you'd answer a question for me. I said, at all of our Ivy League schools for the last two decades, we've been teaching all of our young business scholars that ethics are all relative, that there are no absolutes. Now when they go and live relativistic lifestyles, we want to put them behind bars. I said, the very ethic we taught them, they're living out. Now we wonder what's gone wrong. Silence. Yes, that's true, isn't it? I said, yes, it's true. I said, when Enron messes up with the lives of so many people at the helm, we're being relativists. There were no absolutes. I was showing an audience yesterday, what I have in my pocket is a $100 million bill. <laughs> Gives me a wonderful sense of security. <laughs> this is an authentic $100 million bill. Don't laugh at it. There's only one problem. It's from Zimbabwe. <laughs> where the inflation rate is 500 quintillion percent per year, and prices are doubling every 31 hours, and the people there are not laughing. You know what it says underneath $100 million on or before 31st December 2008? I got this in October, two months before it expired. Wouldn't have bought me a loaf of bread then, buys nothing now. Do you know why? There is no point of reference of actual value for this dollar bill. 
You want to talk about morality without a point of reference, the same thing will happen as what's happened economically today where there have been no morals behind the scenes and it's payday someday. There is no moral law. There is no absolute. One philosopher of science says ours is an age where ethics has become obsolete. It is superseded by science, deleted by psychology, dismissed as emotive by philosophy. It is drowned in compassion, evaporates into aesthetics and retreats before relativism. And the usual moral distinctions between good and bad are simply drowned in a maudlin emotion in which we feel more sympathy for the murderer than for the murdered, for the adulterer than for the betrayed, and in which we have actually begun to believe that the real guilty party, the one who somehow caused it all, is the victim and not the perpetrator of the crime. Without God, there's no moral law. Without God, there is no meaning. You block God out. Where are you going to find your meaning? What does life ultimately really mean? You turn to the scientist to give you meaning. You turn to the skeptic to give you meaning. And you go through life beginning to find out that life has sort of become a kind of a circular thing where you run on, it's a treadmill, you're going round and round and round, or else like the myth of Sisyphus, you roll the stone up, only to watch that roll slow, that stone rolling down again, and life becomes this purposeless, nihilistic, desperate, repetitive action where it has no ultimate destiny, no ultimate point, no ultimate essential value. Can you really talk of values and talk about purpose apart from God? Life becomes so despairing in that. You contrast the world of naturalism and secularism. You contrast that world which offers no meaning. No meaning. Oh yes, they've tried. It is nothing more than a game with words. The emperor has no clothes. Lee Iacocca said of this, in these twilight years of his life, He's asked himself this question, what has it all really come down to for me? And I quote him, he said, fame and fortune is for the birds. So what has it come down to? Fame and fortune is for the birds. And then he ends by saying, if you haven't loved your very family in the process, what has it really mattered at the end of the day? Jack Higgins, the famous novelist, the best known novel, Eagle, the Eagle has landed. Somebody interviewing him asked him what his thoughts were on life and what he now knew that he'd wished he'd known as a younger man. And he said, I wished I'd known then what I know now, that when you get to the top, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Ted Turner said the same thing, he put it differently. He said, you arrive at the top and you're greeted by a bag full of holes. Think about it. What is your life meaning right now? What do your actions mean? Why do you go to the places you go to? Why do you keep the vows that you keep? What does all this actually mean? You know, can I just take a few moments and summarize for you? what it is that Christ actually offers you in meaning. It's a whole new paradigm. You know what he offers you? He offers you one of the most daunting realities to begin with. He enables you to see your own heart as God sees it. It's a glorious day when you can look inward and identify who the real you is. He took the children of Israel wandering for 40 years when he could have taken them in that journey in six weeks. And he said, I did this so that you would see what was in your own heart. Evil, adulteries, envy, strife, murder, jealousies, all this that rages within every human heart. I was telling an audience some time ago, and you forgive me for the bluntness of this, I was flying out of a country I shall leave unnamed. It was taking one stop and then on its way to Hanoi. This a few years ago. And there was a Dutch woman sitting next to me and we got into a conversation. 
she was very guarded in disclosing who she was. I was guarded in disclosing who I was. Because tell anybody, you know, you're a preacher or you talk about spiritual things, it ends the conversation right there or you're being psychoanalyzed for the rest of the journey. <laughs> so I generally tell them I try to solve people's problems. And that <laughs> opens up a whole conversation. She said to me, uh, I'm, I, I, am, I have a work that takes care of children. I kept probing and probing, and when she found out what I did and what my life was, she said, I can tell you what I do. She said, I was in this country because I'm rescuing children from being sexually abused. I said, were you successful here? She says, you know, there's a part of town in this country where we just took off from. It's called Snake Alley. She said, men come at the end of each day from their work, and they are given a concoction of snake's blood and hard liquor. And then they are given whatever they want to satisfy themselves. She said, I walked through that street every night, and last night I rescued an 18-month-old baby girl who was being sexually molested by this man who'd come back from work to do what he wanted to do. And I still remember when, when I first heard that, I thought, you know, I'm going to be sick to my stomach. I don't even want to think or put in my mind the image of what has just been portrayed. What has happened to the mind of a man who wants to do that? What is the matter with the minds of human beings who offer that to the man who wants this? What happens to a government that turns a blind eye to this sort of a thing and allows this to exist? You know, before we stand back and think that evil is out there, Jesus very quickly corrects all of that and says, evil is in your heart and in my heart. We are all as badly off. But then what he offers as a, as a, as a rescue for this is not an education. It's not a higher degree. D.L. Moody used to say that if a man is stealing nuts and bolts from a railway track and you want to change him, you send him to college, at the end of his education, he will steal the whole railway track. <laughs> Do we need any proof of that now? You know, we used to say you can take that to the bank. <laughs> or we'd say better insure that. You better be careful which bank you take it to and which insurance company you insure it with. We've lost all of this in the process. And all I'm saying to you is what Jesus said is when you look at your own heart, there is nothing you can do in all of your volitional power to change the inclinations of your heart. It's always evil. It is that interjection of divine transformation and grace that changes your hungers and changes your wants. It takes away the passion for the here and the now and the this. The transcending reality of what is spiritual and what is eternal and what is ultimately true and noble and good. And not only does he disclose that and offer that, one of the best things he offers for you and for me is forgiveness. I want you to listen to me carefully. Have you ever thought of the logic of unforgiveness? Have you ever looked at this world and seen the logic of unforgiveness? If you go to Gaza today, you will see an unforgiveness that has lasted 5,000 years. In Albania, they have a law. It's called the law of Kanun. The law basically says if anybody has wronged you or your family, it is up to you to avenge it or pass that on to the next generation so the next generation can avenge it. And this law of unforgiveness goes on and on and on. If you have anybody in your heart today you have not forgiven, that person right now controls you more than anybody else. And I stand before you tonight to say, that Christ discloses your heart. He transforms your heart, offers you the forgiveness that only God in his grace can offer. Like the person, the elementary school teacher who wrote, he came to my desk with a quivering lip, the lesson was done. Have you a new sheet for me, dear teacher? I've spoiled this one. 
I took his sheet all soiled and blotted and gave him a new one all unspotted and into his tired heart I cried, do better now my child. I went to the throne with a trembling heart, the day was done. Have you a new day for me dear master, I've spoiled this one. He took my day all soiled and blotted and gave me a new one all unspotted and into my tired heart he cried, do better now my child. God's forgiveness of your heart and cleansing those are just three aspects which the world cannot completely understand. Bernard Shaw refused, read, described beggar, forgiveness as a beggar's refuge. He is right. You are a beggar, and I'm a beggar, but it is not a refuge. It's the grace of God that's willing to pronounce you and me clean and give us that new start in life. How do you find meaning? Ultimately, the hunger for meaning is found in one thing and one thing alone. It's in a right relationship with God who discloses to you the blueprint of your existence and the purpose for which he's made you. And then your eyes see your fellow human beings in the same way that God sees them like Jacob and Esau who had quarreled with each other and were trying to do away with each other and the grace of God met both of them and one says to the other, I now see in your face the face of God. 